Hello, right, my name is David Axtell, um, and tonight we're going to be talking about fake art and about exactly the wide scope that it ranges from through being not genuine imitation, forgery, or counterfeit. Um, that's the fake part, but I think art also incorporates all of those pieces as well together. And um, this is basically an introductory talk about fake and what it could mean for you as a when you join this residency, um, how you interpret it, uh, which is all up to you. But there's certain um, pieces on here that I'll be sharing tonight that will sort of uh, give a little insight into what um, fake is, fake is becoming uh, with the fake news, and also how people have um, defrauded um, uh, galleries or other artists or even artists disowning their own work um, in a way to um, uh, take away their um, ownership of their own artwork um, which is uh, which is quite uh, relevant today because uh, some artists have been doing that for, for a number of years and um, I'll, I'll share a few examples um, but uh, during the time that we do the residency, it's up to you to, you know, like I say, interpret it whichever way you would like. Um, so yeah, if we go on to the next slide. Yeah, the fake news. Um, so I guess, what, could we move it a little bit? Mm -hmm. right, I guess. So basically, fake news is, um, it's all become a bit, you know, it's become the propaganda of those in power um, with fake, tr with, well, Donald Trump coming into power, he's used a lot of it for his own agenda. And in a way, it's uh, basically waving away all fact as fake, and then you can put forward your own um, agenda, really. Um, and it suits those in, in, in power. Um, with the um, Facebook scenario, everybody's basically been uh, clickbaited, really, because you uh, the news stories come up and big headlines say, and you're attracted to that. And then as soon as you go onto it, you're just bombarded with adverts that are on those pages. And you're not really aware whether or not you're looking at something that is um, real um, and yeah so um, yeah if we go on to the next slide Paul's oh, just seems to be a little glitchy yeah so basically this this one came uh, this one introduced me first to the, the idea of fake um, uh, fake art um, and it's basically when the Trumps came to power, um, Richard Prince disowned his artwork, but in a way it wasn't his artwork, it was a, self, a selfie taken, Ivanka Trump took the selfie of herself being made up for some event, um, and Richard Prince appropriates other people's work, um, and sells them as big inkjet prints of famous people and makes lots of money out of it. Um, but he's denounced this piece um, and basically calling her fake. Um, so in a way it's, it's that sort of Joseph Boyce thing of saying, oh, everyone's an artist, but really they're not really. I don't think you can um, bring about a wide scope like that to a lot of um, uh, to people, but... Um, yeah, he's, he's also um, got artwork that, um, that he takes from other photographers as well. So he's, he's always in, um, copyright infringement has been a, a big thing with him. Um, other photographers have sort of tried to sue him over the uh, use of their copyright material. Um, and also Ivanka Trump herself, um, She's kind of an upholder of women who work um, and has released kind of videos on the subject. Yet the same administration um, has eradicated 
before and after school programs known as the 21st Century Community Learning Centres, which serve more than 1.6 million children. And also the administration is getting rid of Michelle Obama's Let's Move, which is a school lunch program uh, where they're trying to introduce nutritional value to the kids to beat obesity. So in one way you've got um, a bit of window dressing there, I think. Uh, she's kind of takes that kind of uh, adopted the first lady role in a way. Uh, she's always been one to uh, help out Donald Trump with his business. She's got her own line of clothing and stuff. But um, yeah, so this is basically Richard Prince um, gave the artwork back to, to um, he sent her back, he sent her back um, $36,000. And um, there we are, canceled that, um, that payment so she so can uh, pay for a few more, you know, Makeup sessions with that money. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so Richard Prince, um, the art of appropriation, and this is what I'm talking about with um, what's genuine and what's counterfeit or fake, what's, uh, what's reliably genuine when um, artists take um, you know, well known work, say from pulp, Western novels, or you know, it's just kind of maybe like a lot of romantic novelty type things with a nurse on, or and then he's like re repainted them um, and sold them on as his own work, uh, changed it slightly, um, added the mask on for these women uh, from the book cover that didn't used to have a face mask on, and um, yeah, so it's all about ownership, who owns what. And considering a lot of the stuff is online, um, you're not really seeing the originals at all, you're just seeing digitized formats of them. So even the originals of the photographer's works, you're just seeing the Instagram pictures of them, not the original photography prints. Um, but that's why he has had a bit of trouble with a couple of people where, um, yeah, he's kind of, taken the photographer's work that, uh, you know, they've maybe gone out for a couple of days, spent time with the model or the famous person, uh, photographed them, had their time, put it up as another work to show in their portfolio, and he's appropriated it um, onto Instagram. He's kind of like tweeted a little picture, uh, piece under Richard Prince. Um, has a little sentence to send underneath each picture. Um, and then does an inkjet print of it and sells those uh, for thousands. Uh, so it's a kind of, you know, in a, in a way I think it's, he's questioning originality, reproduction, replication, copyright, everything in there, but it's all kind of, um, it's basically just copying and, in, and it's quite sort of lazy, um, lazy art really is it's quite quick and easy to do um, I'm not sure why some people are fooled by um, spending thousands on on an inkjet print or um, or even an acrylic based image but um, yeah it's just the way that he, he denounced his the previous work as fake obviously about the person but then um, you know he's always used found images before and re reintroduced them into his own work. And um, by using um, a reproduction, he's kind of finding a new originality in the, uh, in the, in the reproduction of it, uh, which is a different, different case altogether. Um, yeah, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so basically this goes on to what John Berger was saying. Um, who had died recently in, in January. Um, yeah, the unu uniqueness of the original. Um, uh, obviously, Richard Prince was recreating new originals out of the reproductions. Uh, and yes, the meaning is no longer to be found in what it says, but in what it is. So again, you're kind of creating a new original out of something that's been reproduced. Um, and society no longer looks at the image itself 
what it says or trying to represent. Instead, the piece will be valued as to its rarity and whether or not it's an original piece of work. Um, so, you know, therefore you've got basically a lot of, uh, well, you know, there's a lot of uh, scope as to think and what you could actually produce with um, representing new original pieces of work by using um, reproductions. Yeah, if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so you, Julian Roosevelt um, has done a, a video, as, well, a film um, that's going to be released in June um, that's on in certain um, art galleries. It was uh, developed in uh, 2015, uh, shown in Melbourne. And basically they've... Um, taken manifestos from futurists, dadaists, and situationists, and they're basically stolen from the page, robbed of content, and given new jobs for their new speakers. And Kate Blanchett um, takes on those roles, and um, she becomes a school teacher, instructing a new generation, and manifests as a ballet teacher, choreographing bodies rather than minds. Uh, manifesto is a, a mourner, eulogising not the death of a person, but the death of an idea. Um, but if you can take a look at the uh, uh, introductory piece to the, uh, to the film. Isolation, I am illuminated by the marvelous incandescence of my electrically charged nerves. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, how do you, you know, you've created new identity, you know, obviously Kate Blanche is a, a great actress, but how do you create, you can create new identities um, uh, for a you know, new manifesto, or a fake new manifesto, or, you know, how these manifestos seem like they could be almost fake because they've been um, re- uh, I don't know, she's sort of given a, a, a new definition to, to each of the manifestos. Um, so I think that's quite an interesting, uh, interesting film there. But I, I just quite like the, the cut there where it said, you know, all current art is fake. And it does make you question, 
how do you stay original um, in the world today when we are bombarded by so many um, uh, replicated images about well-known artworks and there's such a lot of, uh, well before you just you know, go to your local library and try and find those art books where you could try and find the, the images that you liked or the paintings that you liked and now you're just bombarded all the time and it takes nothing for anybody to uh, copy anybody's artwork nowadays, um, you know, from, you know, and, and also what is, what is, what is original, what is, what is, what is real, what is, uh, what is this interpretation of art, how do you define what is genuine? Um, uh, and I think um, yeah, we've gone to the next slide. Yeah, you know, like just like anything that's counterfeited, you know, you've got um, you know everybody you know wants a decent Gucci bag now and again, don't we? But how do you, you know, products are faked all the time. You know, if you don't want. If you don't want the Heinz baked beans, you can always go for the, um, you know, supermarket branded ones and, and stuff like that. But if everything um, in the fashion world is, is, is kind of up for being faked. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, and, and the money and effort and so, um, yeah, and also, you know, real leather, not genuine leather. Um, you know what? What was what's more real? Having a bit of leather on a bag, or not having a bit of leather on a bag, or not having a bit of tallow in your five pound note, or not a bit of tallow in your five pound note. I mean, which? How fake can we get? How much more fakery can we deduce? Do we need to have animal products in um, bags to prove that they're more real than others? I don't. I don't know. So, um, yeah. So. Yeah, well, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, we, um, have we jumped in that one or not? I think so. Here's that one there. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so, well, yeah, we have Jeff Coon's work, uh, now, new exhibition up and running. Um, Now, um, you know, obviously he's got into the fact of creating a new original bag, the Jeff Koons Da Vinci bag, and he's uh, replicated famous works, you know, Van Gogh, Picasso, uh, maybe it's a Titian now, I'm not sure what that one is, but, and then he's put these blue balls in front of the pieces, um, but you know, is that is that genuine or is that another sort of a, a gimmick? I'm not sure exactly what what he's trying to say with those pieces, um, because obviously if you know he's had a lot of numerous assistants um, helping him out on, on these pieces, uh, I'm not sure whether or not he's actually painted parts of any any of them at all. I'm not sure. Um, maybe he has. Um, uh, but he's used the blue balls in various other sculptures he's done. And it's, well, I'll, I'll read what he said about them. Um, uh, these are all handmade paintings. Everything has been painted by hand. There's nothing printed. Every mark on here has been applied by a brush. You know, why there's legions of assistants. Um, but how original is it to do that? In this day and age, because um, basically it's another copy of a, of a, you know, of these artworks. I'm not sure where it, where it's going with this, these pieces. Um, uh, but he, the artist hopes the work strikes a grand and all-encompassing dialogue between an individual viewer, the history of art, the contemporary gallery environment. Um, but however, one thing that work is not about, and that is copying. As Coons put it, it's not about being a copy. It's not art that's about copies. This is about this union of being together, this dialogue. It's the concept of the avant-garde, of being together in a group and participating. 
should authorship recognise all those who worked on the project, like a film with their credits? You know, should everybody, you know, maybe there's 20 people working on one painting, I'm not sure. Does it all have to be Jeff Koons' name underneath? Um, and just like Richard Prince has used found images, I mean, well, Sickert used them as well, and painted those photographs. Um, isn't, and this seems like a post-pop art era where you're now sort of, not only you know, did you take sort of things that are mass produced, now paintings seem to be everywhere and mass produced, uh, reproduced everywhere, and now you seem to be um, copying the, well, he says it's not copying, but it's a, it's a, I suppose you've got to see the copied originals to view, to have an understanding exactly what you'd get from it, exactly as, as if you're, you know, the ball there reflecting you in it as well. Um, but, yeah, so next one, right, please. So. Um, yeah, Fake or Fortune, so this uh, BBC program, um, with Fiona Bruce. Um, so one of the first programs about was trying to deduce whether or not this was an actual painting by Lucian Freud. And he always stated that it wasn't his, that he'd never done it. Um, so they went out of their way to try and prove that he did actually paint it. Um, and in fact they found out that he painted this during his teenage years at the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing just before the outbreak of World War II. Again, it's denied by the artist, uh, but it's one of his earliest paintings. Um, uh, and um, the same program um, uh, found out that the man in an oriental costume, once attributed to Rembrandt as a portrait of the artist's father, was on sale in a gallery in Cape Town, South Africa, and the painting was identified as a work looted by the Nazis and was reattributed to Isaac de Jordeville. Um So yes, uh, I've actually not seen this program, but um, it's uh, it's interesting how the fact that artists have, you know, uh, maybe they just don't like the style of how they um, came up with these first original pieces, um, but yeah, original foil there, um, attributed to him. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, yeah, it's been going on for a while, uh, Fakery. Uh, Michael Andrew got involved, uh, summoned fake antiquity, he had sculpted and then aged it artificially, uh, and he's good at adapting ancient Roman sculpture, was seen as proof of his great talent and potential. Uh, and he had his great skill of copying other artists' drawings and keeping originals and returning copies in their place. So every, you know, most artists do copy um, artists that they like or enjoy seeing and viewing. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, next. Oh, yeah. Um, Yes, so this one is basically, you've had people, um, you know, well, I'm not going to talk too much about actually uh, forgers yet, but um, yeah, now machines are doing it. Well, a new painting in the style of Rembrandt has been unveiled in Amsterdam, painted nearly four centuries after the famous Dutch artist's death. It took over two years and it does look remarkably like the real thing. The next Rembrandt brings back to life one of the greatest masters. Only this time, Data is the painter and technology the brush. Together with experts from various fields, over 160,000 fragments from all of Rembrandt's 346 paintings were analyzed using 3D scans and digital files upscaled by a deep learning algorithm. Facial recognition software was designed to understand Rembrandt's style and generate new facial features which were assembled based on his use of geometric proportions. Finally, using a height map to mimic Rembrandt's brush strokes, 
The painting was brought to life through an advanced 3D printer that printed 13 layers of paint-based ink. And so, 347 years after his death, a new Rembrandt painting made from zeros and ones emerged, unveiled and exhibited in Amsterdam. On nextrembrandt.com, people could dive deeper into the process of creating the digital painting. The launch video helped spark a global social conversation about where data and technology can take us. New schilderij van Rembrandt. Just from a data standpoint. Rembrandt makes a return. The number of old equations is still a seemingly impossible task. 148 billion people. It looks precisely like a Rembrandt portrait. The world was buzzing with all the leading news channels and blogs reporting about the fading boundaries between technology and humanity. Almost a hundred million people joined the conversation about ING's innovation defying imagination. The next Rembrandt. What's next? Yeah, so, um... Algorithms could give us a new Hockney. Um, uh, you, know, you know, there will another computer study all his portraits he's recently done and then come up with a new one. Um, I'm sure we'll all be um, <coughs> scanned by a computer somehow or, or like um, photographed and then painted as a Hockney or as a Rembrandt um, um, in time. And yeah, so now we're coming to. Yeah, so this was um, backdated on the uh, Skyhouse program. Yeah, so we come to another uh, famous art forger, John Myatt. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah, for nine years, led a separate professional life as a painter of Brac, Matisse. Giacometti, Cavoisier, faking their styles so that his paintings passed the real thing. And John Drew uh, sold the forgers to dealers, aged the works with vacuum dust and varnish. Uh, this was back in the 1980s. And, uh, it, but what threw a lot of people was the fact that they, that they actually gained false records. Drew um, created false records and replaced old archives with new pages to claim authenticity. So that's uh, that's the uh, that's the de deception and uh, well, you know, uh, um, yeah, and he basically got away with it for a number of years. Um, but then obviously uh, you can see John Mayer uh, now on Sky Arts um, painting um, uh, well whatever style um, is appropriate for you, the painting in whichever artist style you, you wish. Um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, and then we come on to uh, one, of the, um, one of the oldest galleries in New York, Nerdler Gallery. Um, yeah, 2011, um, closed down uh, because they sold 40 forged paintings uh, supplied by an art dealer in Rosales, uh, claimed to have access to never seen before works owned by an anonymous collector. And Basically, I think what, what, what happened was that it, well, recently it was at a Manhattan federal court. There's a lawsuit brought by Sotheby's chairman, Domenico de Sol, and his wife, Eleanor, because their well, wife had bought a fake Rothko painting for $8.3 million. And Gallery had bought the, the fake Rothko for the bargain basement price of Nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars before selling it for eight million dollars, um, but the defendants contended that they were misled, and the yeah, outlet experts were misled over it. Um, next slide. And um, the artist who painted painted it was this Chinese guy Pei Sheng Kuan, uh, ten class of the art students leave New York. Uh, he's you know, a, 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 a good painter in, in his own right, but obviously he couldn't. Um, fund his own work his own way uh, was uh, was paid thousands of dollars um, well, 
Cali charged millions. And he also created this new um, Jackson Pollock painting, uh, but he signed it Jackson Pollock and not Pollock, which is a pop Jackson Pollock would have signed it. And but that fooled um, the art establishment as well. Um, he's now in China, but it just goes to prove that even now, um, art connoisseurs or art buyers are fooled by art forgery um, or fake, fake art. Um, next slide. Yeah, so we go on to plagiarism basically as well with um, Karamein China. Um, does this remind you of anybody's work in particular? Next slide. Yeah, so we've got Janusz Kapor's, Janusz Kapor's um, artwork in, in Chicago there. Um, and it seems that in China today it is permissible to steal the creativity of others. The Chinese authorities must act to stop this kind of infringement and allow the full enforcement of copyright, which I think is um, to the benefit of all artists and writers in the area. And such like, but it's it's kind of this idea that um, well, even countries are now getting on the on the bandwagon of uh, you know plagiarizing other people's artworks and sculptures. Um, yeah, so the wrongful appropriation and stealing of other of another author's thoughts, ideas, or expressions, uh, because the original idea is considered intellectual property and is protected by copyright laws. Uh, yeah, so copying words or ideas from someone else without giving credit. Next slide. Yeah, and in the, what we've got here as well is, well, we spent a billion pounds on the shard, and they spent a billion. China spent a billion dollars and got a fake, fake art to trick them. Art to trick Sorry, um, I forgot. Um, and this 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 place was um, designed to accommodate at least ten thousand people, um, but it remains sparsely populated. Um, local media labeled it as a ghost town. Uh, large streets remain virtually empty. Um, where China's aspirations and its traditional culture collide. Um, and it's surrounded by farmland and wide roads. Farmers can be seen working in fields with the mock Eiffel Tower looming over them. Uh, China's also recreated Tower Bridge uh, with four towers. Um, they did recreate the Sphinx, uh, then Egypt complained to UNESCO and they had to tear it down. Um, so it's kind of this uh, um, sort of almost Disneyfication of the world. Um, Yeah. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.